Hello, hello, and welcome to yet another episode of Digital Success. We we have with us today Mr. Masimo Baron, CEO of Smart Card Marketing. Masimo is a Montreal-based entrepreneur with over 25 years of experience in paytech and fintech, with multiple successes in three tech startups, all of which went went to become public offering companies within three years of their inception. That's a great thing. So very interesting topic today. We are going to discuss financial inclusion, how digital lending can help. Before we begin, here's a short intro video of Mr. Barun. Hi, Masimo. Thank you. Morning at the same time. <laughs> yeah, pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a pleasure having you. We are looking forward to having an excellent discussion. So uh, uh, without uh, spending much time, uh, if you can step in and give us an understanding of uh, your 25 years of journey, three uh, startups that went to become public offering in three years, that's a great feat. Uh, if you can uh, give us some anecdotes of your sure, my yeah, pleasure. Uh, well, I, I started in my, my career in Montreal, obviously where I was born. Um, was in the family businesses, uh, growing up with the, my parents uh, in the hotel and restaurant business, and you know, at one point I decided to venture out and uh, was recruited by uh, M Banks, uh, a, a new startup bank the division from uh, uh, one of Canada's largest banks, BMO. And, you know, from there, uh, you know, uh, I sprung out and the, 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 well, I, I found that the, the whole banking system was, the, you know, the, not only the way of the future, but alternative payments was going to become, you know, uh, everything at least innovation. Because I realized at that point, you know, payments is everything, regardless what you do, you know, someone needs to get paid or you need to distribute money or, uh, and then I discovered the remittance markets and I realized, you know, how much more that was, and uh, throughout my career, I had the, the you know scars and trophies, obviously in payments, and uh, I learned that you know alternative payments and infrastructure was key. I've, I've uh, developed three startup companies, always in the payment space. Uh, I've never been a me too guy, so I've always developed my own applications. Uh, I've had the wonder and the blunder of going into and certifying products and working with the card networks and discovering new strategies and uh, ultimately uh, working with so many projects in many countries that uh, I got a good understanding of infrastructure problems and, you know, the wants versus what's possible. And then, uh, you know, and part of this discussion today is, uh, you know, is it, if it is possible, is it profitable? You know, and, you know, that's really the underlying question is, you know, can it be done where someone is willing to 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 jump in and and make it possible and again you know we see a lot of projects and announcements throughout the world every day big projects even bigger than one can imagine and then we discover right. they never get deployed because they discover immediately that uh, moving money is not cheap and the smaller the loan the higher the cost you know right so uh quickly stepping into it uh we uh, I said I said that uh, like we discussed paytech and fintech. So yep. these are essentially uh, I think at the top of the keyword ranking chain in terms of trend today, right? Uh, globally, VC investments to number of startups that are coming into paytech and fintech market has been increasing over the time, like, uh, like very fast and very very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are trying to work on it. At the center sits financial inclusion. So without financial inclusion, there is no penetration in terms of fintech or paytech. So what are your thoughts around new, as you said, there are a lot of projects that are coming in to solve this problem of financial inclusion through fintech. However, a lot of them are not being deployed. So what are the challenges in terms of uh, financial inclusion? And what does essentially financial inclusion 
entails and means because for different demographics it would be very different for india it is of internet and education of uh, banking system is a deterrent for financial inclusion there must be something else for other demography like in canada there must be something else for uh, not not uh, uh, north america something else so what do you think as a whole what financial uh, inclusion means and how a lot of projects that are being planned are not being able to very uh, be very successful and at the same time some of them are so if you want to talk about that sure it's a loaded question uh well look, you know fintech and paytech uh, go hand in hand okay and no, regardless the the fintech product or service or offering you need to marry it with some form of payment distribution or uh, method uh, to get the, the the money out there the you know depending how you define inclusion okay or the underbanked the, the you know then demographics play into the whole picture and for a lot of countries you know uh, india philippines for example it's not the core you know the outreach is the you know underbanked that we can get to where the you know the villages the communities uh, all these yes. areas where you know everyone's advertising on how they want that community to be part of the financial inclusion but you know we don't realize that the infrastructure isn't there you know the simple thing of a, of a smartphone versus a cell phone we take for granted that you know in these villages not everyone has a phone so if your target is the yes. phone you know we have the you know analog versus you know digital and yes. there might be one community leader who has a phone in that community and everyone groups toward that person. So, you know, you almost need, you know, we call them brand ambassadors or leaders today, where you need to reach out to those people for inclusion. And a lot of big companies don't realize what's required. And in our in our part of the, the, the market, you know, when we talk about micro loans to get out to these markets, we don't realize that connectivity, even, you know, uh, the depth of, of, of how to get into these communities requires much more than we're willing to invest. And I think that's a part of it. But to take fintech today, you know, as you mentioned, you know, there's billion dollar projects being launched daily and around the world. And that's I, I follow a lot of what's going on. And, um, you know, one big one recently, I, I won't mention the name, but, you know, they, 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 not, they, they raised a, a sizable amount of capital for the unbanked and underserved but they're not really targeting the underbanked and underserved they're, they're really going after the youth market in populous or dense cities so you know yes. the message is skewed on who's actually you know being targeted and i think fintech does open it up but i don't think the we still need a brick and mortar approach tied into the digital okay and that's because at the end of the day the customer doesn't have access to that information that we're trying to sell them. And that's a big part of the problem. Right. So uh, now, as you said, it's not it's the outreach that is what matters in terms of financial inclusion. So now I come to the fact that we have been talking about something called super apps in order to create yeah. a environment for people to start using financial products or becoming more financially uh, active in terms of using digital payments and all. So do you think super apps is the next answer to financial inclusion? Oh, I'm a big sponsor and supporter of super apps. Uh, well, okay. I, of smart card itself, you know, uh, we have 17 marketplace technologies. So I, I really have a heavy focus in super apps. I believe they're the, they're the way to go. I believe in ecosystem like communities. Uh, to bring everyone in together. I think banks and telecom or enterprises, uh, you know, they have a merchant base, they have a consumer base, and they have a, the underbanked. And I think the super app is the, is, is the way to get everyone working together and the money flow. Because remember, sometimes the money doesn't have to be redeemed. It just has to flow in the network. And exactly. that, that itself helps the, the whole financial inclusion because sometimes... It's, they don't need actually the cash. They just need to be able to transfer the payment to, you know, for some form of product or service that they require, which can be less costly than trying to redeem the money, cash it out, and then trying to pay, which might even be impossible in, in a lot of areas. So I believe the super app is the way to go. 
Now, obviously, there's still the challenge of do they have phones or are they still dealing with, you know, uh, villages or communities that need that access. But, you know, that's still the mobile phone becomes the hub. We had projects where mobile phones were brought to small towns uh, on given days and people would gather together and the distribution of the funds or remittances or products were done uh, by even bringing in trucks with ATM machines, you know. Uh, so there's a lot of ways projects can can evolve, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, in in order to make it all work, um, I think the super app is, is you know is is absolutely necessary because uh, people need an access point. Any experience or any incident? So as you said that you have experience that uh, once in a week somebody would come in with a mobile app. Mobile, mobile phone, and then they gather around the brand ambassador and then uh, get their stuff done. So, any any examples or any experiences that you had, like that, has uh, been impactful in your life, in the in, uh, in your uh, uh, career, early in your professional yeah. journey? Yeah, I, you know, uh, from to, you know between 2014 and 16, uh, actually a little prior, a lot of projects were going on in the uh, Philippines, Africa, uh, and so forth. Um, I can't mention the surnames of the non-disclosures that were in place, but you know, delivering SMS or text messages uh, for remittance to uh, small villages where on a on a Friday or Monday, uh, a certain locations were given, and then uh, a team would go out to that area, and then you know, community of a thousand, two thousand people would come to a specific designated zone, and then uh, money or remittances where cash did or payroll or some form of service was given. Now, the challenges that come with that, uh, you know, most people don't want to talk about, um, you know, there's a cost for, for the service, obviously. It's expensive. Um, yes. So you need a lot of people. Then the, the micro remittances, you know, people don't understand that, you know, a remittance could be a dollar US to $5. And that's a, that's a costly endeavor uh, to redeem uh, for anyone because, you know, cash itself costs money, you know, and someone to deploy a full unit and security, that's a big issue. Now, you're, you're going into areas, uh, regardless of the country, we all have that problem, or countries, where you're bringing in money to a designated time and spot, okay? And, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you uh, what that, you know, you know what, what comes with that kind of a problem where, uh, you know, it's like walking out of a Western Union on a Friday out of a big line. You know, everyone knows you're walking out with cash. You know, you instantly become a target. Okay, so uh, you know, so you gotta you gotta be frequent. You gotta be mobile. You gotta move things around. And uh, you know, even the best telecom companies, uh, one of them in particular that we worked with, the challenges were enormous because uh, micro loans were a dollar to two dollars, and that's a big amount of money. Maybe not in our eyes, but in, in some small villages, uh, get them. It'll get them through the month, you know, and uh, for, for whatever reason. So you know, there's challenges, and it's impossible to effectively deliver that money cheaply. Although uh, a lot of companies say they can do it, uh, you know, one way is creating a community bank or digital commerce bank and facilitating uh, a closed loop payment system. Okay, and uh, those have been those have been very successful. Uh, open system, very costly, almost impossible to co control and manage all the variables. Right, right. So now, uh, uh, like coming to what we uh, like and went uh, and want to talk about is essentially digital lending, right? Yeah. So uh, the whole idea is digital lending is kind of driving. Uh, financial inclusion to date uh, in a certain way. How do you think uh, micro digital lendings will be able to drive financial inclusion? Because there is a risk factor associated with it as as the amount size goes down. As the amount goes size goes down, you don't have much of collaterals against it, and the risk increases off in terms of payment repayment. How do you tackle this issue, and how does that essentially drive financial? Well, I think there's two ways to tackle the problem uh, without getting into political statements. <laughs> uh, but 
obviously <laughs> the whole digital side to financial inclusion uh, can work. Okay, uh, the, the the problem is the end user or you know the the, cl the targeted client. Okay, obviously you know whether it's uh, micro amounts or micro loans. A lot of the probability scoring factors have to be taken into account because credit systems don't you know don't exist or there's no way to measure a client's profile. So we have to use you know a, a lot of demographical data and try to sort out you know uh, a way or a scoring method okay and you know unlike uh, mature markets where you have a lot of these matrix uh, that you can access or use and scoring methods and past history you know the bank or financial company or you know fin uh, fintech company trying to provide this service has to really create their own scoring mechanism and that's not an easy challenge and uh, they may or may not have the talent in order to do it. So the risk level is very high, obviously. And with that, uh, you have to consider the amount of money you're actually putting out there. You know, uh, you know, in North America, you know, we have the payday loan, you know, which is a common practice or a payday, you know, cash advance. Now, in these markets, uh, even the Philippines, you know, a five six loan or uh, a micro loan you know might be paid over a month okay and we're talking about very minute amounts of money twenty dollars sometimes 30 even 10. so you know that now you can handle it in the market where unfortunately employment cost is low okay but if you're if you're in a mature market or your infrastructure costs are high it's you know it's a you have no choice but have a digital solution but again you know that data scoring that profiling is is, is going to all be you know 100 percent risk so you really have to uh, look at a, a method of uh, working with the clients uh, reach out a, a reach out program to constantly monitor their ability to pay and you know that's all got to be digital uh, you know, even with chatbots or any form of methods for support, email, text message. So this has to become part of your game plan. If if you're going to put human capital in, involved in this whole process, the costs just go too high, and you know you're going to have to write off half your book. So, like, since we are talking about this, let's bring in open banking as well, because open banking has been something that has been driving financial inclusion, primarily making traditional banking offerings easier to distribute and easier to consume. Well, how do you think open banking is going to, uh, what can I say, impact micro lending and essentially drive financial inclusion? Well. I think it's the future, obviously, uh, but there's red tape. You know, the, the the red tape is how do you onboard a customer how do you, that doesn't have the requirements with the government IDs? Yes. And, you know, so, you know, there's two things that have to happen. This is probably the political part. One is the governments have to step in, uh, and some, ha some have, uh, you know, El Salvador and other countries, you know, even Canada, where you have to oblige big companies or banks the minimum requirements in order for them to give an account to underprivileged, there may be minimal fee structure or support based on what they have. Okay, so that allows them to participate in the financial market. Now, that's not a profitable venture for anyone, but the government somehow has to be involved because the, there's, there's just no way to reach out to these demographics that everyone wants to include. So... If there's that minimum service, then you can have a successful roll-up plan. You know, over the last years, I've been involved in prepaid card programs and so forth. But the problem with prepaid cards, and no, no discredit to any of the major card schemes, is that there's monthly plans, there's charge fee structure, there's redemption card structure fees at ATMs, on-off network, and the costs can run you more than the money on the card. And if it's micro lending, well, it's just not affordable. If you know it'll, the fees will wipe out any advances. So open banking becomes the only solution. And tied in with a super app, obviously you have a perfect marriage to deliver, you know, financial inclusion. Again, you know, today 
uh, you know, the rules have changed. The, the banks used to only service the top 20 and the 80% of the market. Uh, unless they were a treasury client, the bank would not deal with them or, or scale with them or bring them on board. Today, the banks realize that they want the 80 versus the 20. So how do you bring a strategy forward that includes all your merchants, allow them to deploy all these potential projects and you know open up the market and of course the bank has to be the benefit of of revenues and and you know the biggest factor of all is risk and reward right the, the banks are are known for underwriting and, and and scoring and profiling and you know they can't put their capital at risk because that, that's not their job so all these factors become a, a play in you know what open banking really means you know yes the bank will give you access to their apis yes they'll let you participate but that doesn't mean you qualify to be on the network you know that's a whole different discussion um, yes that and we, sorry so that is something where i would like you to elaborate a bit on a bit on oh bit sure on. So, so think from the perspective that uh, yeah so my, so again coming back to lending open banking obviously helps you helps facilitate lending reach of lending quite as much that can we can have today so now the question remains even if the alternate credit scoring mechanisms are in place there are also certain mechanisms that traditional banks use uh, as you said underwriting fraud detections and all to sure. measure whether the le lending is legitimate or not so now with open banking uh, how what do you think is the cautionary tale or the compliance perspective that even governments or even bank regulatory framework should be looking at to reduce such fraudulent lendings? Well, you know, that's, you know, uh, every country has its own uh, mechanism, okay, and, and, and rules and uh, none are equal. Uh, most of them are after the same price, okay, but, uh, you know, the, the rules in India are not the same as in Canada, nor or is Canadian banking the same as U.S. banking? You know, we, and we all saw that when all the markets collapsed. Uh, some remained strong, and a lot of them failed. Uh, but that token, you know, every bank has an underwriting process, a, a risk and reward part, like the card scheme. I can, I can, I and you can walk into a bank at the same bank, same day. They'll uh, approve us both, and one, you know, we may get the same. Uh, card service or one may have restrictions one may not one may have check privileges one may not or the bank may impose five day 10 day 15 holds based on uh, no history right because you need to build a history with the financial institution so fintech jumped in front and tried to buffer the banks uh, and the banks are, are really loving it because you now have a, a wall of risk and the, fin the banks get to decide which fintech player they like. You know, what scoring method that have they created? You know, how are they in the market? You know, the, the joke in the industry was uh, uh, the big bank won't uh, give you same day free deposit on your check. But if you cross the street to their affiliate uh, check casher, they'll cash your check for 3% or 5%. And you can walk back the money across the street to your bank and deposit it. Now, most of the times, the bank will own that check casher or be their depositing institution. You know, and that's the joke, right? But the bank doesn't want to be seen as the person taking the fees in order for that check to be redeemed, right? So, you know, right. everyone has a, a place in the arena. And uh, I think the, 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 the mix where the banks were allowed to jump into fintech uh, gave them a whole new breath of life. And let companies explore, let the big investments pour in, and then the banks can come in and choose their their champions. I think that's the key message of you know how this market works. Yeah, well said. Perfect. <laughs> so, like uh, before I delve into audience questions, which has already started to come in, I have a last question for you. So, so far we've been discussing about financial inclusion and financial lending, we have seen that uh, people who are using such uh, solutions over the period, uh, getting into it, onboarded through super apps, uh, your open banking systems. Now, all these are technologies to reach these people. Uh, 
now what about people which with whom we call new credit right what about these people where you don't have any history uh, you also uh, you are running a uh, lending pl platform right so how how do how from a layman's perspective how does uh, these people how the are these people subjected to credit or lending okay. when they don't have a history how do you uh, credit rate them how do you risk assess them well you know again i think that that, that that's a, a demographic question as well okay uh, based on the region and where they're located because you need a starting point and then you have to look at you know basically you know wh where they're located okay that's i think that's fundamental then obviously you know education wise it is is going to be a big factor that may help determine at least in the profile you know their their, their kind of pathway and from there you can start building right. now we've done the you know in north america you know guarantors to the loan or the, or the, the assistant but you could use the same concept like sponsors you know is there someone uh if the person doesn't have an id is there someone they have that has an id that can help them not to guarantee the loan just to you know uh, help build their profile in some form of uh, either connection so there's there's different ways to be, uh, build a profile for a person and i think that's the first step um you know second is look if, if they have a, a, a smartphone or any phone or cell phone uh prepaid or uh you know with a, a program or a monthly program you start to look at their their billing cycle okay and that might be you know just some little places where uh you can start building a profile okay a lot of people are trying to use uh social media or they're trying to build up the profiles but you know social media provides you uh you know one form of a look into a person's life but yeah. really you know that doesn't give you uh a profile on on their ability to pay you know uh you know, something well if i see the guy partying or a person partying all day long i'm not likely to give them a pay you know or, or a loan you know that doesn't justify if they qualify or not uh, but so you do need to create yeah. some markers that allow you to start building up a profile or what's very popular and i think this could work is um you know you have these credit repair programs but uh and i know it might not apply but if you use the same principle where you help them build a credit or establish a profile to build a credit file okay and i think that's the next step for financial inclusion is help these help people build a profile in order to qualify for a loan you know give them a two-step or three-step journey people you'd be surprised people will follow a program to establish credit so um you know there's responsible people out there so they know that this is the way the economy works now if you do have someone who has even remittance a, a record of you know uh, frequent remittances you know you can already establish some form of uh, program where funds are anticipated so you can really get kind of map out a person and understand you know economically what they're viable for and you know it, it takes a lot to to score a person but ultimately you know micro loans are a hundred percent all risk Oh, I think. Oh, so I'll uh, just to add uh, again. I think the the question becomes then after is the distribution of, of the the payments and access to local payment structure in order for these microfinances. So I kind of just jumped in and kept on going. <laughs> Wait for you back. Hope I answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now we'll uh, delve into audience questions. Sure. Uh, there are already two questions that has come in. How does a fintech company which is into digital lending tie up with a bank for funds? Uh, okay. Well, uh, there's a few ways. Uh, obviously, the easiest method is if the bank has uh, a gateway or an API or some form of structure uh, in order to connect with them. Uh, you know, a lot of companies don't realize that to connect with a bank 
is is not so easy. And I, I don't mean it to discourage people, but the requirements and compliance required to connect with a bank directly yes, is a huge sir. undertaking. You know, uh, best example, uh, yeah. you know, every time uh, I, I go to conferences or uh, or clients call me and says, oh, we know we just signed up for the bank and we're going to connect to them. I said, okay. I said, you know, building a fintech company and connecting to a bank are two different challenges. One, right. if the roadmap of your fintech company didn't include the, the path to connect to a bank, I guess, you know, you're in for a very costly surprise. You know, uh, banks deal with, you know, uh, HSMs and encryption and decryption modules and security. And a lot of that compliance after is on, is on the, the client or the merchant or the fintech company. And, the, you know, we hear about these uh, startup companies who, you know, five days built an app and all of a sudden they sign with a major bank, you know. But that, that, but, you know, that five days may turn into a year and a half trying to get compliance to approve them on the system. So, you know, we tell them, you know, step back and, and, and look at the security measures and everything that you require to do it. But uh, today there's a lot of aggregator API companies, okay, that provide you yeah. solutions to connect with a lot of financial institutions, but that doesn't mean that that bank will give you service. Remember, having an agreement with the bank and having connectivity to the bank are two different <laughs> situations. And uh, you still have to uh, have a relationship or a contract agreement with the institution in order to use their uh, services despite having connectivity with them. So, you know, that rationale doesn't always jive with people. They said, well, I've connected to Bank of America. Yes, but I said, do you have an agreement to be connected with them? Well, no, I have their APIs. Well, that doesn't mean nothing. You know, having their APIs and, and being able to onboard and underwrite and uh, uh, transfer funds through their network is a whole other endeavor, you know, and right. uh, it's, it's a surprise that you might not be willing to, to, to undertake, especially the, 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 the whole segue into compliance. Right. So, so if I am as a company, if I am to, as a fintech company, uh, say use a bank for uh, using it as a payment uh, intermediately, it is rather I use API that has been provided by the bank to a third party and integrate my system rather than getting into a uh, venture with the bank because that would again involve a long term compliance processes, auditing, and all these kind of factors will come in. Correct. Right. And 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 of course, obviously, an agreement that allows you to be to work with the bank because obviously uh, you can't you know mm. you know in, you know in money in money remittance or transfer of funds uh, mm -hmm. you know there's there in every country you know you uh, sometimes it's by state or province independent of the federal versus the local is you know you need licensing uh to transmit money to to send money to accept money you know and with that comes all the aml and ekyc rules that are all you know included in that whole structure which you need to right. be able to you know you hear of all these crypto companies or crypto exchanges or the sec is involved even in india you know the government's playing a heavy role well you know the reason why a lot of these restrictions are being or happening is because they didn't properly underwrite the client or the money initially and when you can't track the money basically you fall under a whole different scheme of problems and no one wants to be involved if they can't understand fundamentally where the source of funds are i think masivo you just made a very clear understanding of why crypto is not being un uh, <laughs> being made mainstream for banks <laughs> thank you for that Pleasure. yes uh, uh, so next question why do msmes prefer digital lending over traditional lending or oh. rather do they well, from my experience, it's because, you know, you have the freedom to shop. You're not limited. Uh, you're not limited to one institution. Uh, there are so many uh, broker aggregators, agencies out there that are working hard to give you money uh, that, you know, it, it becomes uh, easy for a merchant. Plus, the merchant has the, the freedom uh, from, from, from their workplace at their time that they want to. They're not limited to any hours. A lot of them are dedicated to their businesses, so shopping for uh, 
funding or, or, or loans is not as easy. Uh, you know, today with all the major search engines and targeted ads, you know, uh, they find you. So it's, it's easier. And, you know, with the ability of all the online banking and uh, again, uh, all your documents, it's, it's just that much more easier today to do it online. Actually going to a branch uh, during COVID itself is a complicated mess, uh, you know, but the merchants typically do have one problem and I, I, you know, let's not shy away from this, you know, a majority of merchants are disorganized. They don't have the documents ready. Okay. Uh, and, you know, they don't have their income taxes or they're, they're not, their, their business taxes are not paid or registered on time. Uh, their income taxes are, are maybe a year late and filing. Uh, I know this is a, a weird way to look at it, but, you know, typically merchants are lazy. It's business first and right. then financial statements and everything else later. And it only becomes critically important when they need a loan or money. And then, you know, they're trying to gather everything but together, you know, which, which is complicated. But, uh, you know, with online statements and everything, uh, it's easier to gather from a, your desktop than it is to try to produce everything and walk into a bank. Right. I think the fact that it has created a, such a competitive atmosphere for you to choose from sure. uh, in digital lending, that gives it an edge over traditional lending, I think. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the merchant is a, uh, an online merchant or retail, you know, brick and mortar, you know, the, the there's a lot more data available uh, from processing right. and payments, right? So it, it just, and a lot of algorithms have been made to kind of, which by the way, it's an advantage and a disadvantage because the scoring could put you at a disadvantage when sometimes when you're with an agent, you can explain better or you have the chance to uh, walk through underwriters. Sometimes, uh, Although it's digital, which is obviously the, the, the preferred method, but you know sometimes we're at a disadvantage. But uh, today you have far greater, better experience online uh, than in a in a brick and mortar financial institution. And the digital the digital solutions can today produce a scoring right. record in less than five, sometimes even less than twenty seconds. You know, yeah. uh, they can actually give you a, a, a potential var variable. Of your success rate before you apply okay and right. that's important because you don't want to have refusals uh, or rejections on your uh on your file which will hamper you it from being able to get a loan right 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 that is uh, the next question is are microfinance okay are microfinance institutions a good, viable, and sustainable option for financial inclusion. So I'll reframe this. Uh, so the question is that are small and microfinance institutions are good and viable options for financial inclusion? Would they be able to drive, or do you think that bigger institutions should be the one who take who should be taking this initiatives? I think micro financial institutions have more flexibility. I think they, they okay. they're more yes. they're more creative enabled to mm -hmm. and they probably have a, a a better focus on a target market and demographic and i think the banks need that uh in order to build out a profile and a model that's you know right. again I, I always say the banks are restricted by marketing red tape of risk and reward and starting a new a new division okay? yes there's so much cost when we're too big when we're small, we're flexible and scalable. And basically, uh, we have a better, you know, reach into uh, a very specific demographic. And I think, uh, especially with micro, the banks don't want something that's micro itself. You know, they want something that's scalable, that has traction. And if they're going to put their money behind the microfinance, they need to make sure that you know, all the red tape has been cut through and then they could bring it into a regulatory framework. Okay. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's what everyone keeps on missing is 
there's regulatory frameworks that restrict large institutions. Yes. Okay. And right. sometimes the government or, you know, mo uh, regulatory agencies let things be gray for a while. Okay. If it serves a purpose. Right. Okay. I use the word gray as a dark gray. <laughs> but, uh, well, because they, they know that, you, you know, <clears throat> look, take the Philippines and, uh, you know, I work there often. <clears throat> You have 7,000 islands, okay, right. uh, hundreds of banks, but it's impossible to reach out. It's it, they're, they're, it's just impossible, okay? So right. you need these microfinance companies or little bubbles to, to implant themselves to be the outreach. And, of course, once mm -hmm. they've figured out how to hum and buzz, what we call it, then the large players come in and say, okay, thank you for figuring this out. Thank you for letting us understand how your model works. Now we're ready to back up the big capital. And sometimes people say, I don't understand how they got so much money for what they're doing. Well, they figured out how to cut through the red tape. That's the money. And that's the that's the model. I think we got our insight. Cut through the red tape and that's the model. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, last question, Masimo. Sure. Uh, digital financial inclusion also carries the risk for same vulnerable financial for being vulnerably finance uh, vulnerable towards financially being excluded and undeserved person. so basically the question is that while uh, digital financial inclusion uh, is a good thing it also carries the risk of being financially excluded from the benefits and the opportunities how does how do you want how does people overcome that well, i'll give you an example uh, in India, there are a lot of small financial inclusion uh, instruments that has come in, where uh, and and they have penetrated to the tier three and the rural areas. So now, due to lack of education, some somebody may be investing in that financial in instrument. However, they don't know how to make best out of it. So they're losing the opportunity and obviously the benefit and becoming more and more. Uh, what can I say? Ever ever and towards getting into. Uh, digital finance and digital lending or digital uh, loans or working on digital platforms for finance uh, in terms of money and uh, operation. So how do we overcome that? Well, you know, <clears throat> there's there's a, a moral issue to the problem. OK, it's yeah. and, you know, the reason I say that is uh, no one wants to help the poor unless there is a profitable outcome. OK, and there's a cost to moving money and there's a risk to profiling someone who cannot, who doesn't have a history. OK, so you have all these factors. Now, if they have a, if the person has a digital footprint, maybe, you know, they might have a smartphone, they might have a data plan. So is that the inclusion we're talking about? Because that doesn't really hit the demographic of people who are not included in the financial market, because if that person has the means to be could be to be connected, you know. Are we talking about the poor or we're talking about the impoverished? Okay, so you, you need the government to step in or subsidize because there's there's a part of that transition that needs to take the impoverished, and I hate to say this, to bring them up to poor standards, to bring them up to a class that basically you know is financially healthy, and healthy meaning that you know they're at par with society okay so it becomes a, a very political place to put big money into impoverished areas and microfinance digital or not <clears throat> digital means <clears throat> metropolises cosmopolitan areas it means places where communications are <clears throat> are available and accessible so yes. that inclusion is really restricted to what we're talking about if we're talking about really including the underbanked, the underserved, and getting out there, there's heavy costs. Okay, that that could take still, you know, a lifetime because a lot of time. You know, you need the 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 want and the ability, you know, to to get out there to those customers or build customers up for the future. Okay, that might be a, 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 a you know, I'm not going to say it's philanthropy, but from the from, 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 from financial institutions, but 
it's just not profitable. And if it's not profitable, no one wants the risk because you're gonna have incurring losses plus risk. It's you know two measurements that you don't want in your books, right? So when you look at the, the outreach of these communities, and I'm gonna go back to even North America where the church is the pillar for money, for remittances, yes. for families who are, you know, immigrants, you know, or new immigrants, you know, every, we all have our waves of immigration. So the church is where they have their confidence. So the rabbi or the priest or the, you know, the, or the brother or father or whoever, you know, you want to call them or the her, well, they're the pivotal point for distribution of money back to the country. And those right. small little, we call them bodega stores or the sorry, sorry stores, you know, like in the Philippines, look, they're in every neighborhood. They reach out to a very specific community. There's a usually an old woman and man, they're there. They control the little book with giving credit right. to those people and then they wait for the money to come in so they can pay. Right. You know, that goes on everywhere. And, you know, so the key of that message is even in every little village or outreach program, there's always a key person, hopefully a good one, not a bad actor, that takes their money. And that person helps distribute funds. And those are the people you need to work with in order for funds to be distributed. Now, they're gonna take a piece of the pie. That's the way it works, yeah. okay? You have to be accepting yeah. of that factor, but you need to board those people on board in order to get into the community. Because that's the only way, and by the way, they're the only people they trust. Okay, so you know, there's a, a human element to, to digital. Okay, uh, if you want to get into this question, if you don't want to get into yeah. those areas, and you want to keep it digital, well, we're not talking about the impoverished anymore. We're just talking about right. a different class. So, I, I hope I didn't go too far into that one, but uh, it, no. it, there is a divide, and if we don't accept that fact. And we don't understand what underserved means. No, no. I think the first step of under, a solution is understanding where the gap is or the mistake or the Correct. missing something missing is. I think that is spot on where you have actually been able to pinpoint. And frankly, I have I this is the first time I had such a frank discussion on financial inclusion because it's such a rosy picture that has come up of financial inclusion over the time. <laughs> Everybody is talking about it. Nobody is talking about the red tapes. Nobody is talking oh. about the fact that it takes money to move money, exactly. which is one of the most important thing we have learned from this session today. I think that is something all the entrepreneurs who are listening to us today uh, would like to take away from this: the understanding of red tapes, how to navigate uh, traditional and uh, government and digital at the same time, and obviously talking factually about financial inclusion, not just the rosy picture. Thank you, Masimo, for every kind of insight that you have helped us with today. Pleasure, it was an exceptional, exceptional talking to you today. A lot of good insights, a lot of good things to take forward for us. Thank you for Beautiful. your time. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, uh, just before I leave, I just want to say, you know, um, the whole crypto factor, yeah, especially yeah. in India, and I think why crypto is winning such a great uh, well, it has a momentum is because, you know, with crypto, everyone can participate, even open up an account. Yes. Okay. Whereas, yes. whereas equities, you know, every government and country has financial restrictions on the amount required to open an account. So people exactly. are missing the logic why crypto is becoming more favorable than banking or uh, equities or stocks. Because I can tell you firsthand, whether it's India or Philippines or Hong Kong or even North America, the requirements to open up an account for equities is much more higher or minimal requirements are too difficult for the underserved. For crypto, if they can get access to an account, which they, you know, they can actually have an account or sponsored account and they're able to transact. So the barrier to entry is very minimal versus financial. Very low, very low. Very low. And it's been a pleasure. That is spot on. That is spot on. Pleasure. Pleasure, Masimo. Take care. Thank you. Take care.